Welcome to Feel Good From Within. I'm Yvette Leblowitz, your host. Today's guest is Carrie Sackville, who is a columnist and author. In The Secret Life of You, Carrie Sackville shares how a bit of alone time can change your life, relationships, and maybe the world too. I really hope you enjoy listening into this podcast episode. I'm super grateful that you're tuning in. Are you ready? It's now time to listen in. Carrie, before we dive into your book, are you happy to tell our audience a little bit about yourself? I would love to. I am an author and a columnist. I've been a columnist for a few newspapers here in Australia for a while now, a decade or so, and I've written for pretty much every publication at one time or another in the country. I'm the author of five books. This is my fifth book. And I actually started my life as a social worker. So I trained and worked initially as a social worker. And then I went back and finished my second degree in English and linguistics and then took up blogging when everyone was blogging and moved into the writing world from there. But I've always been really fascinated with people and relationships and why we do the things we do. And so that's really what I've always written about. And when it comes to your brand new book, The Secret Life of You, what inspired you to write your book? It was a very, very dark time in my life. It was actually a dark time in many people's lives. It was 2020. We were in lockdown here in Sydney and I'm a single mother. At that point, I'd been divorced for about seven or eight years. I had three kids at home at the time. Since then, my eldest has moved out. I had two very unhappy children. They were doing uni online and were miserable. I was absolutely miserable. I was having health problems. I wasn't feeling well. I lost a lot of my work because in COVID, you know, the media kind of took a really big hit and I had very little work to do. And I was really lonely. I spent a lot of time in the past seven years dating quite frenetically at times, really just, I think, to distract myself from that fear of being by myself. And I couldn't date anymore. None of my other distractions were available to me. I couldn't see my friends. I couldn't see my mom. I couldn't go for a wander around my local shopping center, which I always like to do. And I found myself spending hours and hours and hours just scrolling through my phone and really turning to my phone to distract me from how I was feeling, how lonely and despondent I was feeling. And I realized that scrolling through my phone for hours was actually making me feel more lonely and more disconnected. And it came to a bit of a crisis point where I was feeling really low. And I realized that I couldn't keep going like this. I couldn't keep running away from myself. And I made the decision to put down my phone. And when I say put down my phone, I mean really turn my phone off and avoid picking it up, avoid turning to social media, and to learn just to sit with myself and sit with my thoughts. And my aim at the time was to try to become a friend to myself as I was a friend to other people, to try to learn to support myself and comfort myself and to try to learn just to be comfortable being alone because it was something that I had always run from. It was a real process. It was really hard. And there were times when my whole body was like screaming out to pick up my phone, but I stuck with it. And once I learned how to do that, and I started to research the benefits of alone time. And I was absolutely astonished by what I learned. And alone time is absolutely vital for our emotional well-being, for our capacity to have healthy relationships. It's important, obviously, for self-awareness to learn who we are and what we want out of life. It's important for us to be able to have full and fulfilled lives. And it's also really interestingly important for moral courage, which is incredibly important important in the world today. When I learned all that and when I realized the effects that learning to be comfortable alone had on me and how it changed my life, because it really did change my life quite dramatically, that's when I decided to write this book. What were some of the alone time things that you did? So instead of looking at your phone and scrolling through the social media content, what did you do in replace of that? In the very early days, I started off slow and something I write about in the book is I'm certainly not recommending that people who've never, ever been alone with their thoughts or who find it really distressing or uncomfortable, you know, go off to a silent retreat for five weeks. Like, no, like start really small. So the way that I started is going for walks without my phone. I'd been exercising for a long time. I'd always gone for long walks, but I would always be listening to an audio book or a podcast or talking to a friend and looking at a video. There was one time where I was picking up my daughter from a dance class and I was outside 
and I was just walking back and forth while I was waiting for her on my phone and I fell over a bench because I like found myself doubled over and I was like how did this happen and I was looking at my phone so what I did is I started going for walks without my phone and just being out in nature and just being alone with my thoughts for that half an hour that I was walking. I did a lot of journaling. I'm really into journaling as a way to connect with yourself. You don't have to be a writer to journal. You can literally just write bullet points down or jot down words about how you're feeling. So I did a lot of journaling. I did a lot of literally sitting on the couch and thinking my thoughts, asking myself questions as I'd ask someone else questions, like the kind of questions you're asking me. I would ask myself, why did you do this? Or what do you want? A lot of it was, what do you want? out of your life how do you feel about this you know what's your opinion about this and so I started trying to just ask myself my opinion before I ask somebody else theirs and we all do that all the time I mean you read a book and you know the first thing you do after you read the book is go and look online at reviews of the book right or you ask your friends have you read that what do you think of it instead of asking ourselves first what we think so I started to try to ask myself my opinion before I asked other people. I try to show curiosity about myself and, and who I am. And I'm sure our listeners will be able to resonate with maybe falling over something <laughs> while they're using social media because we try to live in this connected 24-7 world. And in the book, you touched on your kids. And I think the youth of today, not all but some, aren't used to being on their own without a mobile phone and without access to either Snapchat or, as I say, adult social media content, yeah. even though they're a kid, that must be a balancing act being a parent. And then children of today have all heard about another person at school who has the latest iPhone and they're all on Snapchat and they want to be on TikTok and all these things. But once again, we're breeding a generation who aren't able to sit in their own presence oh, on their gosh. own and they're highly yeah. addictive to one of the most addictive dopamine drugs, which is the mobile phone and social media. Or well, how do you try and influence them to take a break from technology? This is such a huge issue. This is why I wrote the book. I'm not sure people understand the impact of an entire generation that can never be alone with their thoughts. The first part of the book, you talk about why people can't be alone with their thoughts and then all the benefits to being alone with their thoughts. And we tend to think about being alone with, with our thoughts, think, well, that's the path to creativity, which it is, but it's so much more than that. And, you know, for young people particularly, they need time alone with their thoughts away from social media for their mental health. We all do for our emotional well-being. You know, we're not meant to be consuming content all the time. Our brains haven't evolved to be able to deal with that. We need time for our brains to power down. And when I was growing, I'm now in my early 50s. I love to say early 50s, but I'm heading towards mid 50s. But you know, <laughs> when I was growing up, if I was in my bedroom, I was alone with my thoughts. We didn't have telephones that extended to the bedroom. We had landlines. They were all in the kitchen. We didn't have TVs in our bedroom. When I got to, to my teenage years, I had a clock radio. So that was really exciting. I could play music in my room. But if I was in my bedroom, I was either reading or writing or just daydreaming. If I was walking to school, I was daydreaming. If I was sitting on a bus, I was staring out the window. But kids today, Every single time they're alone, they don't have to daydream. They don't have to be alone with their thoughts. They can just pick up a phone and be connected to, as you said, Snapchat, TikTok, or all, all the apps, which, as we all know, are designed to be addictive. And because they never do spend the time alone with their thoughts because they don't have to, what happens is they're losing the capacity to do that. And they actually become really agitated when they're not connected. And you hear of kids who are bashing down walls and, and getting incredibly angry when they can't have their devices. And unfortunately, when you get to a particular age, it's almost too late. I mean, I would never say it's completely too late, but I can tell you, I can see a huge difference between the way my 22-year-old and 24-year-old use social media and the way my 15-year-old does. Even in that period of time, there's been a difference so that my big kids had some time without social media when they were growing up, whereas my 15-year-old has grown up with it her whole life. And if I could do anything differently, I would delay giving her a phone. I would have set much clearer 
boundaries much earlier on. It's much harder to do that when they're teenagers. And I see all the time, as I say, I go for walks every day. And sometimes I'll, I'll go for a walk. There's a place nearby where I'm by the ocean. I can walk and there are tons of people walking past and there's trees and there's dogs and there's lots to look at. And I see toddlers in prams who are looking at an iPad because their parents have given them an iPad. And I don't blame the parents. Like this technology makes life a lot easier for parents and parenting is really hard and we all want to break. But when kids are given iPads or phones really early, what that happens is they lose that capacity to engage with their environment, to be distracted by their environment, to get lost in their own thoughts. And all kids can do that. Like you see little kids playing with their toes or they're chatting to a toy. You know, that's them talking to themselves. We are actually robbing them of those moments of solitude by giving them devices too early. And it means that they will never learn to do that. And when they get to be teenagers, they'll be on their phones 24-7. And it'll have huge impacts on, on the way they live their lives. I have interviewed Dr. Shimmy Kang, who's a neuroscientist, a child psychiatrist, Harvard trained, and they have done MRI scans. And she talks about it in the podcast on my show. They've done MRI scans on toddlers who consume adult social media apps, and they actually have holes in their brain. So it is damaging their brain development. And we know now that adult social media apps and consuming all of that content does trigger mental illness. The trouble is, unlike cigarettes, where there's a label warning the consumer, none of us ever received that warning when we downloaded Instagram. Yeah. And parents weren't even informed either, Carrie. So yeah. It's really only coming of age now and especially over the last few years that all of this research is really surfacing and people are openly talking about it. So, Kerry, I've got to ask you, what are some of your alone time rituals? I feel very passionately about my morning coffee. <laughs> so when I get up in the morning, I have a whole ritual in the morning about how I like to start my day. And so my 15-year-old leaves for school usually about 7 30 so she goes to the bus and I wait until then to start and then I sit down and I have an orange first of all I love my orange I've been starting my day with an orange for honestly I think about the last 40 years it's ridiculous and I, I eat my orange and I sit by myself and I really savor that orange and then I make my coffee and you know I like to warm the cup and I froth the milk and I put the chocolate on top and then I sit just by myself with my thoughts. I mean, there are times when my partner is here and we have coffee together or if I'm at his place, but when I'm home by myself, I really treasure the start to my day, just those moments of silence, just those moments by myself alone with my thoughts. I walk. These days I usually take my phone with me when I walk because I track my steps. You know, again, those apps are addictive and I've become addicted to hitting my 10,000 steps. And whether or not that's wise is for another podcast, but I don't turn it on. And so I have my phone just in my pocket tracking my steps and I literally just walk and I think my thoughts. And I'm very into these days, and I've written about this in the book, I'm very into thinking for pleasure. And something that I learned when I was researching the book, I read a lot of stories about people who survived long periods of time in isolation. So for example, people who have chronic illnesses who have to spend a lot of time in hospital or alone at home, people who survived solitary confinement in prison for many years, and the people who do well are the ones who can mine their brains for positive thoughts, positive memories, positive experiences. We're all so good at thinking the worst, right? Thinking catastrophic thoughts or thinking about everything that can go wrong or what we did wrong or how we embarrassed ourselves. But we can also use our brain to think for pleasure. So I tend to replay scenes from my favorite movies in my mind. Now, whether or not they're accurate doesn't matter. I might be getting the dialogue wrong. It doesn't matter. It entertains me. Often I'll reread passages of books that I've really enjoyed in my mind. Just, just little passages or I'll think about the characters. I take a walk around my late grandparents' home. They had a very large home in Melbourne. I used to spend a lot of time there. And in my mind, I'll walk through the rooms. And I do that when I need to calm myself. And I'll, you know, open the cupboards and go into the different rooms and sit on the couch. And I fantasise. And, you know, I talk to people about whether they think for pleasure. And a lot of people said that their, their number one fantasy was winning the lottery. And they would think about what they would do with a million dollars. And I love that one. I, I definitely do that too. For many, many years, I used to fantasize about winning an Academy Award. And I'd been a teenage actor 
that was a long time ago. I hadn't acted since then, hadn't written any scripts. I don't know what I would have won the Academy Award for, but I still, you know, would fantasize about getting dressed and what I'd wear and what my makeup would be. And, and it really feels good. And I think we use our brains far too little for positive experiences. And you just mentioned something there that reminded me as a kid when you're using your imagination and that happens in the alone time. And when it comes to your self-care rituals, what do they look like? I love baths. I really, really love baths. And I spend quite a lot of time in the bath. And in fact, my partner was just here and he looked in the bath. He's like, what is that? And I, I like, I have these special scented Epsom salts. And I've actually sprinkled them in the bath and I was about to turn the bath on. And last night I was getting ready to have a bath and then one of my kids needed me so I couldn't do it. So it's actually sitting there. And as soon as I finish talking to you, I'm going to go and get into my bath. And I love my bath. And I also actually take a lot of naps. And I think resting is really important. I think resting is important for everyone. We live in this culture where busyness is kind of this badge of honour. Oh, I'm so busy. I'm so important. I'm so needed by everybody. We really do undervalue rest and we undervalue stillness and time alone. And I don't think you have to earn rest. You know, there's this whole kind of narrative about, oh, if you work really hard, you can earn a nap or you can earn sitting down with a cup of tea. You don't. Like we all deserve rest because we are human beings in the world. And the world is hard, right? It's actually, you know, it's really challenging. Most of us have a lot of challenges in our day-to-day life. So I rest as much as possible and I will go and lie on the couch. Sometimes I'll fall asleep. A lot of the time I literally just let my mind wander. I'm very good at now. It's I think it's a muscle that you, you need to practice using. And I can literally close my eyes and drift off and into my own private world. I find that really replenishing. I love that messy rest and the naps and the relaxation. It's so important. I've never had Netflix ever, not in my entire life. And people are like, what do you mean you've never had Netflix? You don't have Netflix, you don't have an account. And I was never. People are like, what do you do? And I'd just be like sitting there in a mindful moment. Yeah, it's so fun. It just gives me a good space to relax and just not consume. Absolutely. I watched very little TV. I tend to watch shows with my partner occasionally with my kids but not when I'm by myself very rarely if there's something I really want to see I'll I'll watch it but it's not something that I do routinely by myself I mean I read a lot because reading is a form sort of connection with another person because you are sitting essentially with another person and their thoughts and it requires concentration and it also requires imagination because you are reading words but your your mind is filling in the the blanks and you're seeing the characters or you're seeing the world that the author is is sharing with you in your own head but tv is really passive And social media is even more passive and not just passive, it's eroding attention spans as much as anything else. But Mm. what happens with, with heavy social media use is you lose connection with yourself because when you're using social media, people think that social media is connection and it's not. Social media is just connectivity. And in order to connect deeply with ourselves, to feel comfortable alone, we need to connect with ourselves and we also need to connect deeply with other people. So when we connect deeply with other people, those connections nurture us when we're alone and the more connected we are to ourselves the more we have the capacity to connect deeply with other people so it's very symbiotic and social media interrupts both of that because it stops us connecting with ourselves and then it stops us connecting deeply with other people because messaging somebody or liking their post or sending a dm might communicate some information but it's not deep connection deep connection comes when we're doing what we're doing now is actually looking at each other and speaking spontaneously and being vulnerable and looking at each other's body language. I mean, if I was messaging you by text, I could sit there and I could curate what I was going to say and I could edit it or I could get somebody else to write it. You know, that's not real connection. That's very friction-free connections. They're very shallow connections. So social media is eroding our connection with other people and our connection with ourselves. When you're reading a book, as an example, when I read your book, I'm going to find out a lot more about your personal story, your thoughts, than even in an Instagram caption, which is a paragraph or so. Yeah. And also, it's interesting. I love to read. I always have a mantra. I choose reading over watching reality TV. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things when we came out of lockdown and the pandemic, I got a sense of how powerful it is to connect with humans 
yeah. with your family and friends and how different it is in person with that energy and it's completely different as you said just sending a dm during the pandemic there was this big message everyone was banging the drums or banging on about one of the things we've learnt is we need to slow down this is one of the most important yeah. silver linings <laughs> from the pandemic it's made me realize how much i need to slow down and do less and now everything's open and it's like that was a load of bs it's like yeah. brrr, do, 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 do. people are like yeah. posting three posts a day do this TikTok. you need to do more ai is coming la 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 like it's gone so insane. frenetic yeah it's frenetic life is really frenetic and chaotic and that's why we need to just find those moments of peace with ourselves because life is really chaotic because there are people who love alone time and we'll talk about it and then there are other people who say, mm. oh, God, no, I can never be alone with my thoughts. And one of my favourite quotes was from a woman who said, I need alone time because there are knots in my brain that need detangling. And I can relate to that so much. I think we get very overwhelmed because there is so much content in the world and you turn on your computer just to check your emails and then there's a stream of emails and there's the news coming at us 24 hours a day and then there's there's all our social media sites and then there are people you know sending us whatsapp messages in the 17 whatsapp groups that we're part of and so i think it's really important to curate all of that and to cut it down as much as possible so i have pretty much everything on my phone muted I've taken off nearly all the apps on my phone. Yeah, you know, certainly Facebook. I've gone off Twitter now. I've gone off LinkedIn. I'm still on Facebook, not on my phone. But I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram and that's it for social media for me. I've got so many WhatsApp chats, you know, with old school friends, with, with my old mother's group, with family, and everything is muted except for messages that come through from my kids and my kids, wow. my mum, my partner. Everything else can wait and I can check messages when I turn on my phone or the times that I look at my phone because those endless pings, not only are they distracting us from whatever else we're doing, but it's keeping us like in this heightened sort of chaotic state. Again, I hear my 15-year-old at the table. We have no phones at the table, but I can hear her phone bing, 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 bing in the background. And our brains aren't meant to deal with so much stimulation. And we need that time also as well for our emotional well-being as well as for our relationships, which is a whole other story why we need alone time to be in healthy relationships. But we need it for our self-awareness and we need to be constantly checking in with ourselves because we all change as we get older and the world is changing constantly too. So it's not just enough to kind of do a deep dive into who you are and what you want out of life when you're in your 20s. You have to keep doing it. You have to regularly check in with yourself and make sure that the way that you're living is meeting your needs and that your relationships are meeting your needs and that you're comfortable and content in your career, in your personal life, in the way you run your household, everything. Like we need to constantly be checking in with ourselves and we can't do that if we're forever just focused on content from other people. And I think when you mention that content from other people and you would know this, Kerry, as a writer and a columnist, an author, when we compare content even from now to say 10 years ago or 20 years ago, we're now living in a time where the amount of content is not viable for anyone's no. mental health. We're at a peak where people keep singing from the hilltops, you've got to create three pieces a day or more, 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 more. And the reality is we don't need more, we need less. And we only 100%. need it created when it arises from within naturally because yeah. we've got people pushing out content just because they get told they've got to do it this amount of times to be relevant, to not get left behind, fear of missing out. I've seen the world do more yeah. content. But I don't think it's sustainable and I do think that more people are cutting down on their social media consumption even just with things like how much news they consume and mm. what accounts they follow I think you have to I've found that you know being a columnist you know I need to sort of be abreast of the news but you know there's so much of it and it's mostly so negative and it was actually mm. affecting my mental health and I decided that I'm not going to read too much about the things that I can't do anything about because it just mm. upsets me. So, for example, I get terribly, terribly upset about the situation in the United States with, you know, the erosion of abortion rights and with gun violence. 
And mm. so I'll skim the headlines about that, but I'm not going to take a deep dive into it because it's too upsetting and there's nothing I can do about it. I'm not in America. I can't influence that. And I think we all have to look after ourselves. And I think one of the things kind of that you sort of touched on is that all this endless content, it's almost because everybody else is doing it. So we feel we have to do it too. And that's also why we need to be able to take a step back and just sit with ourselves. And we need that because if you don't sit with yourself, if you don't take a step back, it's very easy to get caught up in group think, right? Mm. So in group think, we don't look for what makes sense or what is right for us. We look at whatever the group believes to be true. So the truth stops being what is actually true and starts being what everybody else is doing. And in terms of social media, that's this endless content and posting these videos and, and jumping on the latest, you know, TikTok bandwagon. And we need to step back from that and get in touch with what we believe, right, as opposed mm. to what the group thinks and whether that is right for us or not. And if it's not right for you personally to be posting content three times a day or, in my case, to be writing three columns a week, it's just not viable. It's not good for me to be consuming all this news. I know who I am now. I know what I need. I know what my values are. And so I can say that's not for me. But to mm. get in touch mm. with that inner voice, we have to be able to spend time away from the influence of other people. Yes. And do you like to do meditation and mindfulness practices? Certainly mindfulness, yes. And that's something I've done for a long time. When I'm distressed, I can now actually talk to myself through moments of distress. I can actually say, you're okay, you're right, and, and look around at 10 things and or count or check in with my body. In terms of meditation, for me, I think that when I lie on the couch and I go off into kind of a the back of my mind. For me, that's, I think, a form of meditation. It's not traditional meditation, but I can very easily go into almost like a fugue state where I am awake and yet I'm almost in a dream state at the same time. Yeah, I do that a lot. <laughs> I love that. I love lying on my yoga mat and go practice meditation and mindfulness. But then, like you, I just love to lay down, have nothing on, check in with myself, really just see what's going on within. Yeah, because I have to figure that out. And that's when you know if your neck sore, your lower back sore, <laughs> or if something's troubling you, or whatever it might be. And then some other times, it's just so peaceful and blissful. I'm like, I don't know why more people don't do this. Doing nothing. That's so much better than having to write six blogs or do three of the latest reels, TikToks. It's really relaxing. If you're not used to that or you don't feel that you can control your own thoughts, mm. it's really scary and really confronting. Mm. And what I learned in all my research and talking to people is that the one criteria for being able to spend time, a meaningful, healthy time mm. alone with your thoughts, is that you can control the direction of your thoughts. Mm. So if you are in active trauma, if you are in the throes of mental illness, or if you just cannot stop your thoughts from going mm. to a really dark place, then alone time can be really scary and uncomfortable. And so in that case, obviously, people need to feel safe before they can be alone with themselves. And so they may need to talk to a therapist or journal or start off really, really slowly. So rather than an hour or two, just literally have 10-minute or five-minute bursts where they're alone before they can kind of delve into actually being alone with their thoughts for an hour or more. You know, something that I think is really important to point out for people who really struggle with being alone with their thoughts is our culture is bad at a number of things, but we're very bad at dealing with pain. We all have pain in some areas of our lives. We all have disappointments or resentments or sadnesses. And people are very scared sometimes to be alone with their thoughts because they feel that those painful feelings will come to the fore. The thing is, it's important to allow yourself to feel those painful feelings. Pain is only dangerous if we don't let ourselves feel it. If we keep trying to push it down, then it's eventually going to come and bite us on the bum. But the thing to know about pain is that when you allow yourself to sit with it, it doesn't overwhelm you. It's, it's not going to consume you. It's not going to completely destroy you. What happens is pain washes over you and it's like waves and then it recedes again and then it comes up again in another wave and recedes. Like it always comes and goes. So even the worst pain, pain of bereavement, for example, if you allow yourself to feel those feelings, it will eventually recede. People need to know that it is safe to feel their painful feelings, that it will pass. They're not going to feel that intense level of pain forever. And if they allow themselves to feel those feelings, then eventually those feelings will become more manageable. How did you find that alone time improved your relationships? 
This is one of the biggest things, and this was also so surprising to me. When we are not comfortable being alone, and whether that means just spending time alone, whether that means being single, whether that means alone with thoughts, what happens is we are then desperate for connection with other people to, to fill our cups. And we all need to get those kind of goodies, those emotional goodies. And so if we need validation, nurturing, support, comfort only from other people, if we can't give it to ourselves or if we get our entire sense of self from other people, then we are in a really precarious position because we are then needing connection, any kind of connection with anyone. And it leaves us really vulnerable. It can make us make really bad choices in our relationships. On a very practical level, if you're scared of being alone, you're not going to be mindful or selective about the people you have in your life. Say if you're like me and you were on the dating scene, you're not going to say, this man, he's not treating me well, so I'm going to move on. You're just going to be desperate to cling on to him no matter what because you're terrified to be alone. And so it's really important to learn to be able to nurture and support yourself so that you can then enjoy other people for who they are. And if they're not meeting your needs, you can actually move on. The other primary reason is that what do we all want out of connection? We want to feel seen for who we are. We want to feel loved for who we are. That's what everybody says, right? What do you want from a partner? I want a partner who loves me for who I am. But if you don't know who that person is, if you don't know who that I is, how are you going to know when somebody else sees you for who you are? So the more that you know and appreciate and acknowledge yourself, the more then that you're going to recognize that person who can see you for who you are. If you have no idea who you are, how are you going to recognize when somebody else loves you? There was this great quote from Ayn Rand. She said, to say I love you, you must know how to say the I. To feel Um, genuine connection with another person, you need to know who you are. And to do that, you need to be comfortable in your own company. That's such a powerful message. How does it feel now to have written the book and for it to be out and for you to be really sharing a powerful message of the importance of alone time for our children, also for women who are finding themselves divorced, first time maybe on their own, or really anyone who is embarking being on their own. I'm really proud of this book. And I think there is something special about something that comes out of a really difficult time because Mm. this was born in great pain and then turned into something really positive. And I can say I've written five books. I've been a columnist for a long time and I'm proud of all my books, but this feels really special to me and it is something I feel so passionately about. I didn't write this for the sake of writing it. I wrote it because I learned that this is something that our culture has forgotten how to do. Our culture seriously devalues and it is so important and it is genuinely transformative for all sorts of reasons. And I genuinely believe and know that the more you are comfortable on your own, the better your relationships will be, the less likely you will be to get into toxic relationships, the more secure you will feel leaving bad relationships, whether they're with friends or family or a partner. The more you're comfortable alone, the more you will know yourself. And the more you will know yourself, the better your life is going to be because you can't create the life that you want if you don't actually know what that life is. The more you're comfortable alone, the more emotionally regulated you're going to be. I'm so much calmer. I'm so much less reactive. I just manage the day-to-day stresses of life so much more now. Alone time is incredibly important for creativity. It's super important for being able to live fully. One thing that I found is so many people are dependent on other people to agree to do things with them so that they can do what they want. Mm. You hear people say, oh, I really want to see that movie, but I can't find anyone to go with me. Or I've always wanted to travel to Greece. John won't go with me to Greece. Being comfortable alone gives you the opportunities to do those things by yourself. So you don't need anyone else's permission to do the things that are going to make you feel fulfilled and happy. And finally, on the cover of the book, I say, how a bit of alone time can change your life, relationships, and maybe the world. So I genuinely believe and know that if everybody in the world was more comfortable turning off the computer, spending time alone with their thoughts, that the world would actually be a better and calmer and less hateful place. Yeah, I love that message. And if I had my way, I would have a media detox for a whole month yeah. every year right around the world. No apps, and we would all just take the biggest break. Reconnect with ourselves, nature, family, friends, community. What is your hope for your newfound book readers? I would really love everybody just to get something out of it. And I've had so many messages from people who say either, thank you, this has given me permission 
to spend time on my own and permission to rest. Other people who've said, you know, I've been single for a long time and I realize now that being single is a valid way to live. I write a lot about loneliness and how to overcome Mm. it and the cure for loneliness and people who said I've felt very lonely and this has really helped me to overcome loneliness and to connect with people in a different way. So I feel like there's a lot of different messages in there and they will resonate differently with different people. So if everybody can get one thing out of it and also to know that I think the overriding message is that even though I'm talking about solitude and promoting time alone with yourself, we're all actually alone together. So we're all part of the human race. We're all experiencing life together. Each one of us is unique. Each one of us is essentially alone inside our own heads, but we're also part of the human race and the community. We can be alone together. I love that. We can be alone together. And how can we stay in touch with you after this podcast show? Well, I am still on Instagram at Kerry Sackville, Kerry with an I, and I'm on Facebook at Kerry Sackville Online. I also have a website, which is kerrysackville.com.au. My email address is kerrysackville at gmail.com. And I love getting messages from people and I respond to every message. Kerry, thanks again. And can't wait to have a conversation with you another time about this very important topic, which is so beneficial to our mental health and well-being. Alone time, mindfulness, naps and rest. Absolutely. Thanks, Kerry. Bye. Thanks Bye-bye. Thanks for listening into this podcast episode. I hope you found this conversation of interest and of benefit to you. In support, I would love for you to subscribe to Feel Good From Within with Yvette Lee Blowitz on any podcast app or on YouTube or Rumble too. If you are listening to this podcast episode on Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave a five-star rating and a review of what you think too. And to share this show with your family, friends, and community. Subscribe to my mailing list at yvetteleeblowitz.com, feelgoodfromwithin.com, or spiritgirl.com. Follow Yvette Lee Blowitz, Feel Good From Within, or Spirit Girl on any social media app. And together, let's feel good from within.